Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Thank you to everyone here tonight, especially our eminent speakers, Professor Rudolf Bilal Ware and Sheikh Mohammed Adiyenka Mendez. Special thanks to our audience and everyone at Hub Foundation and Hub 925 for supporting this event. I'd also like to wish my mom, Patricia, a happy birthday. <laughs> About 20 years ago, she and my father hosted a group of Senegalese, European, and American Marids, or followers of Bamba, in their home. We were introduced to the spiritual and nonviolent teachings of Sheikh Ahmed, Ahmedou Bamba by the late Sheikh Abdullah J. May he rest in peace. And my parents uh, come from Catholic, a Catholic and Presbyterian background, so this was no small feat. And uh, they've, they've shown great generosity and hospitality over the years. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to say a few words about Sheikh Ahmedou Bamba. He was born in Senegal circa 1850 to 1855 and died in 1927. Imagine a scholar and a poet as prolific and influential as Shakespeare, Dante, or Rumi. Professor Ware notes that Bamba is one of history's most pro prolific writers in Arabic and among the most prodigious poets of all time. He penned his first surviving poem, Sindidi, as a teenager in honor of his mother, Jariatullah. He would go on to write an unrivaled corpus of Arabic poems and treatises dedicated to God and the Prophet, peace be upon him, that focus on the purification of the soul and the means of drawing near to God. Yet Bamba was also deeply concerned with social realities and our own practical responsibilities. Here we might imagine a social reformer in some ways similar to Dr. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, or Abdul Ghaffar Khan. One of the main ports of the transatlantic slave trade was Gore Island, just off the coast of Senegal. During Bamba's life, the Senegalese also endured repressive French colonial rule. Bamba himself was forced to endure assassination attempts, exile, imprisonment, and house arrest that lasted for the greater part of three decades. Yet he persisted nonviolently and continued to write and establish schools, farms, and a city, Touba, Senegal, that remains a beacon of peace in the world. Bamba is also revered as a saint or friend of God. Here it might be helpful to imagine St. Francis, Rabia, or the great renewers of Islam and other faiths. Bamba had studied and internalized the spiritual paths of Abdul Qadir Jalani, Abul Hassan Shazali, and Ahmad Tijani. Yet he considered the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be the most perfect guide and model. Tonight, Professor Ware will discuss Bamba's visions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, which inspired his commitment to nonviolence. Bamba is also known to his followers for his miracles. We have stories of him praying on water and even the French authorities trying to shoot him at point blank range to no avail. For those unfamiliar with the hagiographical reports of prophets and saints, it might be useful to think of Neo from the Matrix or better yet, Morpheus. <laughs> yet I would argue that the most important thing about Bamba are his recorded virtues. I believe his nonviolence is ulti ultimately stems from Isan, an Arabic term which literally means doing what is beautiful and was notably defined by the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as to worship God as if you see him. Cultivating a sense of the sacred during prayer, an awareness of the divine, that the divine is here with us, leads to a sense of the sacred in other human beings in the world around us. Becoming aware of God during prayer and meditation is good practice for seeing God in the neighbor and treating them with love and respect. For the names and signs of God, beauty, peace, love, truth, justice, are within us and all around us. I was taught by one of Bamba's students that a sign of divine nonviolence is watching where one walks to make sure one isn't stepping on any insects. And what should that tell us about the sacredness of a human life? 
a human body, a human heart. Why hasn't the world taken notice and learned from Bamba? A major reason may be Islamophobia. We are not accustomed to associate Islam and Muslims with peace and nonviolence. Perhaps even more importantly, most of us tend to ignore the intellectual, spiritual, and social contributions of black Africans. Even other Muslims tend to focus on the Arab world, Persia, Turkey, and India. I would suggest that the cure to our own racism and militarism in the US can be found in West Africa, if we are willing to look. And this is rooted in the peaceful, just, and liberating message of the prophets, including Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all, as well as the unity of our divine origin, the unity of humanity, and the unity of all of creation. Before I, I, I introduce our speaker, a final observation and, and uh, question. It's not enough to venerate past luminaries, however great, whether our preferred prophet, messiah, imam, or saint. We must also aspire to be like them, but in the unique ways that our time and place call for. Are we ready to do the work, the inward spiritual and outward social striving, to be a friend of God, a friend of humanity, and a peacemaker? It's my pleasure now to introduce to our first luminary. And both of these gentlemen tonight, I consider teachers. Professor Rudolf Bilal Ware is a historian of Africa and Islam. He earned his PhD in history in 2004 from the University of Pennsylvania, where he was trained in African history, African American history, and Islamic intellectual history. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of History at, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the founder and director of the Initiative for the Study of Race, Religion, and Revolution. His first book, The Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge and History in West Africa, explores the history of a thousand years of Quran schooling in the region. He is the author of multiple articles on Muslim anti-slavery movements in Africa and the Atlantic world. And his most recent book, Jihad of the Pen, explores Sufi thought in West Africa. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rudolf Bilal Ware. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuhum. That was a little sedate. Um, uh, I was raised in an African-American rhetorical tradition that prizes call and response. I gave the call. Now I need y'all to respond. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so... Uh, I've been asked to um, discuss the life um, and the dreams and the visions of Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, the founder of the Tariqa Muridiya. And if we can have the first slide. The title of today's talk is Visionary, the Spiritual and Social Insight of Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba. Go ahead to the next one. And I've decided to frame our presentation and our study of Bamba and his spiritual experiences and his efforts as a social reformer around the Hub Foundation, the Hub Foundation, because indeed um, the life of Ahmadu Bamba was dedicated to the three things that the Hub Foundation is dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge, the pursuit and dissemination of love, and the realization of both knowledge and love through service, through service to God, through service to the prophets, and through service to humanity. So we'll begin with knowledge. Go ahead. Sorry, that means next slide. Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba um, wrote just of what scholars have been able to catalog within the past 20 years of academic research, at least 200 distinct books in the Arabic language. Some of those books are collections of as many as 200 poems praising the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Some of those poems number as many as 5,000 lines in length. I'm going to let y'all do the math real quick. 200 books, 200 poems per book, 5,000 lines per poem. This man in the tradition of the Muradiya is responsible for seven tons of writing. This is a person who pursued scholarship um, in every form and wrote in all of the different disciplines of the Islamic religious sciences. But after a transformative experience where he saw the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a waking state and not a dream, he stopped writing in all of those disciplines of the religious sciences except for one. He stopped writing books about Arabic grammar. He stopped writing books about theology. He stopped writing books about Islamic law. After he returned from the exile of seven years and nine months to which he was subjected by the French colonial regime, he said, take everything that I wrote before I was sent away and throw it in the sea. From that time, he wrote solely in one exclusive genre, Madih, panegyric poetry, praising the best of creation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the story that is going to serve as the center of my talk tonight is the story of one man's love for the messenger of God and how it inspired a nonviolent movement of knowledge, love, and service. I detail some of this in my first book, The Walking Quran. Um, about this West African commitment to Islamic knowledge that goes beyond just Ahmed Ubamba, but is general throughout West African society. The basic argument of that first book is depicted visually here. The goal of traditional Quran schooling as it's practiced in West Africa right down to the present is not to teach you analytical knowledge of the religion, but rather to transform human beings into living exemplars of God's book and allow them to pass it from one generation to the next so that we too can become Quran walking upon the earth the same way that the messenger of God, peace be upon him, was described by Aisha in authentic narration as the Quran walking upon the earth. That is the core of West Africa's commitment to the learning and the teaching of the Quran. It's not so that you can beat people over the head with its contents, but rather so that you can let the light of it shine from inside your heart to the outside world. Please continue. And if we're going to get the benefits of this story, and if we are going to transform our time in the way that Brother Zachary suggests that we must, we need to look for inspiration in West Africa, and we need to stop avoiding African Islam. The racism that Africans and African Americans experience in the contemporary American Muslim community is crippling and debilitating and contrary to God's law and to the prophetic example. Until we get this sickness of racism out of our hearts, we're not gonna be of any good to ourselves, much less the broader community. And that means starting to pay attention to Africa because one in six of the world's Muslims lives in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are more Muslims in Ethiopia than there are in Iraq. There are more Muslims in Nigeria than there are in Egypt. There's a higher percentage of Muslims in Senegal than there is in Syria. How many people in this room can name two West African scholars of Islam? The Maureen's don't need to raise their hand on this one. We know that, that, that y'all can. <laughs> um. How did this come to be? How did Sub-Saharan Africa come to be home to more than 330 million Muslims? It was through a non-violent jihad of the pen and of the wooden board, the lauch on which people taught the Quran. There was no military conquest that spread Islam to Sub-Saharan Africa. Instead, it was the effort of teachers spreading knowledge, love, and benefit to humanity that transformed an entirely non-Muslim area, Sub-Saharan Africa, to the only place now, Africa is the only continent in the world that has a Muslim majority. It is my humble suggestion that if we want to transform our surroundings, we need only study carefully the example of people like Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, because they transformed Africa without shedding any blood. I'd like the next slide, please. We pay attention to scholars from the Arabian Peninsula, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, Africa needs to be a source of inspiration for the jihad of knowledge that faces us in this country. 
Next slide, please. And I'll go to the next one in, in the interest of time. The basic argument of the book is not just that we need to pay attention to the way that Islam is learned and taught in West Africa, but that we need to pay attention to black people generally in the history of this religion. This image of Bilal standing atop the Kaaba calling people to Islam should serve to all of us as a reminder of the status that black people once held in this religion. And the messenger of God, peace be upon him himself, once said, emulate the blacks, for from among them are three lords of the people of paradise, Lukman the sage, the Negus of Abyssinia, and Bilal the Muazzin. If it was enough, it should be enough for us that the messenger of God, peace be upon him, considered black people to be exemplars of knowledge and piety, that should be enough for us. That should be enough that we should also pay attention. Next slide, please. So knowledge in all of its forms, in all of the disciplines of the religious sciences, but especially spiritual knowledge, knowledge that comes from unveiling, knowledge that comes from the discipline of tasawwuf or Sufism, knowledge that connects spiritual, um, excuse me, character training and ethical purification with the unveiling of spiritual experiences and realities. In this book, Jihad of the Pen, I write a conclusion um, after we've translated um, the writings of a number of scholars, and my essay in this volume is to try to help us understand the relationship between Sufism as the science of akhlaq, of character training, and Sufism as the science of haqqaiq, spiritual realities. And the short version is, is that as you strive to emulate the messenger's example and to purify your heart, you become a vessel that is capable of receiving divine inspiration. Neither my heavens nor my earth contain me, but I am contained in the heart of my believing slave. As we struggle and strive to live ethically and be good people and transform our hearts and the societies around us to draw the hearts of the children of Adam together through love and through service, then the sweet taste of Iman will actually enter our hearts and we will start to see things from the unseen as they impact our daily lives. We'll go to the next slide. It starts with the struggle to learn knowledge in these Quran schools, which by the way, I'll go to the next slide please, are still, people still learn the way that they did in Medina, on the wooden tablets. And when children memorize their lesson, they lick the Quran off of their tablets to show how much they love it and to bring it into their body so the Quran can change you from the inside out. Next slide please. And it's not just for boys. West Africa's Quran schools have always included girls and uh, many of the most important scholars in the Muradiyya in Amadou Bamba's Sufi order have been women. And I'm gonna say to the American Muslims right now, until y'all get right in the way that you treat your women, no good will come of anything you do. God will forbid it because his love and tenderness towards those that share in their womb one of his names will forbid any good from falling upon you as long as you continue to mistreat your women. And I will quote Rabi al Adawiyah, who was often uh, quoted by uh, one of Ahmed Ubamba's daughters, uh, Sohna Muslima Tumbake, um, God bless the women, because no woman has ever been guilty of the sin of Pharaoh, proclaiming that they are the Lord God most high to be worshiped. And if the men don't say it with their tongues, they say it with their deeds. Next slide, please. In the Muradiyya, that focus on equality and dignity and humanity isn't restricted to the male half of humanity. Many of the most important and accomplished scholars in the Muradiyya have been women. And because Ahmed Ubamba understood that while there are certain ritual tasks that are prescribed for men in the religion, piety and scholarship are fields where men and women are on equal footing. If we don't make room for our women to excel in the field of scholarship, where will they express the, the goodness that's in their heart? Where will they contribute to the religion? Next slide, please. And one more in order to keep the picture moving. These three women were all perfectly capable of writing treatises in the same classical Arabic that Ahmed Ubamba wrote in. Yet they wrote most of their works in Wolofal, which is the Wolof language written with the Arabic script, in order to make it accessible to everyone around them. 
And I'm going to remind us that this is the prophetic methodology. The prophets come to teach in the language of the people. And until we come to teach in the language of the people, not just meaning English, but the vernacular, the culture, this place, until we embrace this place and that this place has shaped us, until we tailor our message to this place the way that those women tailored their message to that place, we will be incapable of transforming hearts the way that people like Ahmed Bamba did. Next slide. This is the great mosque in Tuba, Senegal. Ahmed Bamba never saw this mosque. The mosque that he saw was a little wooden building <laughs> that he built with his own hands. This is Tuba on a Friday. This is an edifice that was built on love. He says in one of his poems, praising the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, praises my prophet, my edifice and achievement. This I declare definitively, but I have failed to reach my goal. I cannot equally in praise the nobles of old. My ink seeps away, my mind in a daze, the deputy's guide I cannot extol. For how can I sing his praises when even the sages lack such ability? But I can call all servants to my pillar, though they needn't abandon home or country. O people of land, O people of sea, rush to the pious, the bountiful ocean. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This edifice was built on spiritual striving in the field of love. And the site of love, we can go to the next slide, is the heart. Webster's defines the hub, we're at the Hub Foundation, as the center of a circular structure from which all else radiates. And hub in Arabic is love. What brings together these two definitions, if not the heart? The heart of the human being, its hub is the center of not just love, but also of all knowledge. You will note that in the Quran al karim Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala never uses the word aql, mind, or intellect as a noun, not once. He uses aql as a verb many times, but the thing that does the intellection in the Quran is always the heart. Qulub, hearts, are mentioned 132 times. Sudur, the breastplate that holds the heart, is mentioned 44 times. The fu'ad is mentioned 16 times, the ardent flame of the heart. That is the core of who we are. And if our knowledge is between the ears and not in our hearts, then it is useless. We can pile knowledge on top of knowledge, but without pure hearts, it only increases human society in bitterness. It becomes harsh, hard-hearted, often hyper-masculine. Next slide, please. This is a sincere love, a love for sincerity, for that which is in the heart, because God knows your heart. Think about the test of this religion, not as a 24-hour surveillance camera on your limbs, but as a 24-hour surveillance camera on your heart, and you will be at the beginning of the path of Ahmed Bamba. So now, I'm gonna tell you a love story. In the year before Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was sent into exile for those seven years, nine months, he was making spiritual retreat in the mosque in the city of Tuba that he had found at a small, humble, wooden mosque. And in the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan, he had a vision in a waking state, not in a dream. He had been seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in dreams for some time, almost 12 years when this vision happened. These visions began after he wrote a poem uh, called Should We Mourn the Lordly, Lordly Dead? Hukal Buqa Ala Sadati Namawati. It was a poem praising the great Sufi sheikhs of previous eras. And after he finished it, he confided in one of his scribes, I began seeing the prophet in dreams after I praised these great men. He came as a light inside clothing that was so bright that you couldn't see where the person should be. <laughs> or he was a figure that was veiled behind a veil of light. 
That was how it began, first in dreams, then in waking states, as he struggled to embody those traits. But on this day in 1895, he saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his humble wooden mosque, no veil of light. He saw him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way that you're seeing me. The Prophet always spoke first in the greeting. And he said, Assalamu alaikum ya khadim rasul. Peace be upon you, O servant of the messenger. Servant of the messenger was the title that the Prophet had be given to Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba when he first began seeing him. It was the realization of a lifelong dream. His friends and biographers said that when he was a boy, he used to make the dua, O oh Allah, make me the measure of Anas ibn Malik. <laughs> make me like the Prophet's manservant, the one who clipped his fingernails, who empties his bedpan when he was ill. Allow me to provide intimate, personal service to your beloved. So receiving that title, Khadim Rasul, in those early visions was the fulfillment. And it also explains right down to this day the centrality of khidma, service, within the muridiyah. Because service is the quickest way after sending blessings upon the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to raise one's spiritual station. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Let's get back to the vision. Uh, sorry, go back. It's okay. We'll stay here for a little while. Uh, Assalamu alaikum ya khadim rasul. So the Bamba returns the greeting. Peace be upon you and blessing and God's mercy, ya Rasulullah. And then Bamba asks a question because now that the veil has been removed, the Prophet is not behind a veil of light, nor is he a figure shrouded in light. Bamba sees something that he hadn't seen in previous visions. The Prophet is surrounded behind him on all sides by throngs of people, crowds of people. So Bamba asks a question, Messenger of God, who are these that are with you? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, and these, by the way, come in authentic narrations from Bamba's own sons and disciples, uh, that he related this vision to them. The Prophet ﷺ said, the ones you see with me are the people of Badr. They never leave my side, not even for a moment. The Battle of Badr, when 313 stood against at least 909, the 313 having maybe six suits of armor between them, maybe a half dozen horses, defeated with God's aid, an army that would have extinguished this religion and murdered its messenger. The station that those people hold with the messenger of God is such that when one of them was accused of betraying the Prophet وسلم, later on, the Prophet forbade any action being taken against him and said, how do you know that he has not already been give, forgiven for all of his past and future sins for what he did at Badr? That is the status of the people who fought when it was time to fight. So Bamba conceives in his heart in this moment an aspiration. He says, messenger of God, I love you, and I want to be amongst those who are never absent from you. How can I join their company? <laughs> and the prophet says to him, what you ask is going to be difficult, because the ones you see with me spilled blood when they didn't want to spill blood, and they had their blood spilled when they didn't want to have their blood spilled. Te jamano turdurit wesuna. The time for spilling blood has ended. So you have no sacrifice that you can offer that would make you worthy of their measure. You can imagine Bamba crestfallen, crushed. His heart's desire has been rejected. But the Prophet وسلم, is to the believers, Ra'uf Rahim. He said, but I come bearing good news. 
in three months, you will become the Qutb al-Zaman. You will become the axial saint of your time. Because no one can become the Qutb except that they've reached their 40th birthday, the time of spiritual maturity, of course. But then the Prophet says, but this is really just a formality. If you like, I can make you the Qutb al-Zaman beginning now. And Bamba's response, though he said it in Arabic, is recorded in the Wall of Oral Tradition. It's one of my favorite lines uttered in history. <laughs> that would be lovely. That would be beautiful. But my ambitions now surpass this. <laughs> Being the axial saint of the time is no longer enough for me. Now that I know that there are people who are never separated from you, even for an instant, my heart cannot settle for less than that because I love you. So the Prophet ﷺ responds to him, do you think you're the only one that ever loved me? All of the awliya, all of the saints in my religion have loved me the way that you love me and I have appeared to them the same way that I'm appearing to you. But this thing that you ask is a thing that has neither been asked nor granted to any that preceded you. But if we love a thing, we're not turned away at the first sign of rejection. The one who knocks at the door finishes by entering. So Bamba says, listen, I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> I've told you that I love you and that I can't rest with anything less than you all the time. And I'm willing to pay any cost in order to join the company of those who are never absent from you. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, any cost? He says, yes. He said, fine. Um, the translation is, you must face your enemies in your time the way that they face their enemies in their time. But the time for spilling blood is over. You are forbidden from spilling so much as a single drop of blood. If you spill so much as a single drop of blood, your compact with me is broken. I am not of you and you are not of me. And if you are going to face your enemies in your time the way they face their enemies in their time, then you must leave this city of Tuba that you love. He had been there for seven years. It was his seventh year in the city that he loved. Because you asked God in my name to protect this city until the day of judgment, and that prayer has already been answered. So if you are going to face your enemies in your time, it won't be here. Bamba accepted the conditions of the compact. His eyes resettled on this temporary, vanishing world that is in front of our senses at all times. He returned from seeing the truth that's concealed in the ghaib to this world of five senses. He finished his spiritual retreat in the masjid. He celebrated the Eid and he began packing his bags to leave Tuba. What he did not know was that African chiefs who were jealous of his authority and the fact that people, especially women who were being abused by husbands, especially former slaves who were being abused by their former masters, were running to his community and emptying the chief's villages. In fact, Bamba's commitment to freeing everybody was such that there was once, when he was very early in his career, a man who came to Ahmadu Bamba wishing to make bayat to him, to make him his sheikh, and he offered the gift of a slave to Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba. And Bamba said to him, you own this man? The man said, yes. He said, soko mom yamo mom, nahmag mom nyo boko If you own him, then you own me because he and I have the same master. Absolute commitment to struggling against injustice. That was emptying all of the villages in the towns around Bamba. So the chiefs plotted with the French colonial authorities and lie upon all lies. They said that this man was plotting a jihad against the French. 
They sent him away into exile for seven years, nine months. The first year and a half of that, he didn't know whether his family was alive or dead, and they didn't know whether he was alive or dead. Because when the white people kill you, you stay dead. He was the only prisoner on the island that he was imprisoned on for a span of years. But he emerged from that experience not bitter, but victorious, because he knew that it was the price that he had to pay in order to enter into the company of his beloved permanently. He later confided to one of his disciples that uh, the day that he was sent into exile, the ship went from the colonial capital of San Luis down to what's now the capital of Senegal, Dakar. And it was a Thursday, so he happened to be fasting on that day, Sunnah fast. And uh, they stopped at Dakar, and they wouldn't give him any water to break his fast. And the guard that took him off the boat to hold him on the mainland beat him into his cell. He said, that day on the floor of that cell, I started to ball up my fist. And the Prophet wasallam came to me in that cell and said, you will keep your promise to me. And when you do, I promise you the victory over these people. When he was alone in that cell, when he was alone on that island, it wasn't just the messenger of God that came to him. It was others of the companions. Join us. We know you love him. Join our company. Ahmed Ubamba faced, we can go to the next slide, seven years and nine months away from everything that he knew. We can go to the next one. I'm going to come back to that one. Because he was fully submitted to the will of God. And because he loved God's messenger. He said, take everything that I wrote before I was sent away and throw it in the sea when he came back from those seven years and nine months. Because from that time on, only finding the very best words that he could find in the Arabic language to praise the messenger of God was worth his time. No other kind of writing would do. How many of us look inside our hearts, much less on our tongues or in our hands, for the best words that we can find to describe the best of creation? Here are some of Bamba's. Wahua nafisu fala taqisu. Wahua raisu lilan biai. Shamsu shumo si. Rasaru o si. Hairul anisi. Lilauliai. Shifa suduri. Dia uduri. Badrul budori. Badi diai. A priceless treasure, precious beyond all measure. Prince is he among the prophets. Son of sons, prince of princes, to the saints and ally and dearest of intimates. Healer of hearts, the glow of the hearths, the fullest of moons shining luminously. Divine rain for the grateful, but lion to the hateful or the unfaithful and cowardly. Garden of the guided, fire of the misled, his eminence clear to those who reflect. Eraser of error, bearer of gifts, for creation a guide without defect. He gained his glory on the midnight journey, not in fantasy, but in the flesh. Glory to the Lord, whose beloved drew near by night in innocence at his behest. Once purified, he made the journey, bringing joy to the prophetic assembly. The trustworthy traveled with trusty guide on trusty steed to peaks of purity. Surah al-Amini, ma'al-Amini, fawq al-Amini, lil Ahmed Ubamba spent the rest of his life in erasure, in love for the messenger of God. We're going to move forward in the interest of time. Uh, just keep going until I say stop. Ah, that was the poem that I just read. Stop right here. Many of us that call ourselves Muslims and seek to live a life of service to humanity and to the Prophet, read the Quran intently. When we encounter Ali Imran, where God says, say, if you love God, follow me, follow me. God will love you and forgive your sins. We follow that. So we follow the Prophet and we love the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Granted, few of us in this room, if any, have ever loved the Prophet with the kind of ardent love that Ahmadu Bamba did, but perhaps some of us aspire to do so. But have we fulfilled the condition that the Prophet himself imposed? He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, you will not enter the garden until you have believed, and you will not have believed until you have loved one another. We know that loving the messengers is a condition for loving God, but do we remember that loving humanity is a condition for loving the messengers? Loving the best of creation is easy. He was great. <laughs> loving one another is tough because a lot of us suck. <laughs> a lot of us are not nice to one another. A lot of us are cruel. A lot of us are impatient. A lot of us are indecent but the doors to the garden are closed to us unless we can cultivate that love. What is the core of that love? What is the core of Bamba's message? What is the core of that nonviolence and tolerance and humanism that built a movement that now counts at least seven million people? And those are just that, the ones that identify with the tariqah that he founded. The ones that love Ahmadu Bamba cannot be counted. <laughs> The ones who've had their hearts changed by him cannot be counted. What is at the core of this? At the core of it is a Quranic understanding of what the human being is. That is at the heart of everything that Bamba did. It was at the heart of the Quran that he taught, and it was in the prophetic example. We're back on love, on hub. Study your Quran, and you'll note that every single time that God says, Allah yuhib, God loves, the direct object of the verb to love is a human being, without exception. Note that what, when God creates a thing, when he wants to decree a matter, he has only to say unto a thing, be and it is. But is that how God created the human being? No. How did he create the human being? He created the human being Iblis, why did you not bow to that which I made with my own two hands? And when I have breathed of my breath into him, then fall down prostrate. Everything else is created with a word, an act of discourse, an act of speech that separates the speaker from that which is spoken. God is telling you that you, child of Adam, you, child of Eve, are different. You can become my beloved, and I'm telling you that I love you because I made you with a caress and I animated you with a kiss. And if there's something else in this created universe that I love, I ain't say so in my book. Take that to heart. Understand that the human being is the most honored and noble amongst God's creations. When that understanding of what a human being is enters your heart, the nonviolence, peace, and tolerance become easy. Respecting every single human being, no matter what condition you find them in, becomes easy. Because you understand that in every single human being, God made something of value that is beyond anything else that he ever made. Indeed, I created man, jinn and mankind for no other reason that they should worship me. But why does he single out these two things, jinn and mankind, in that ayah? What is the thing that these two things have in common? Free will. The only things in creation that have the choice to obey or disobey. Why create a thing that's going to cause mischief and shed blood in the earth like we're causing mischief and shedding blood right now? Like they cause mischief in the slave trade, like they cause mischief in the colonial period. I will humbly submit to you that the reason is, is that it is beneath God's dignity to love a thing that is forced to love him back. That the very reason why the human being is created is in order to bring something into being that can be worthy of God's love because it can choose God or other than God. Could you love a thing if it was forced to obey you? The very thing that causes us to detest one another and separate from one another, the very thing that causes racism and pride and evil and violence in all its forms is the condition for love, God's love, to come into this world. 
And as soon as we know that we are the instrument for realizing God's love in this world through our mercy to one another, then maybe we also will be able to see the prophet, peace be upon him, in waking states and not in dreams. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Professor Ware, for that stirring narration, the story. I think, it, I think it speaks to what our tradition is capable of, not only, not only recalling the stories of the prophets and the saints, but the reason that, that we remember them is to inculcate virtue in the present. I'm pleased to introduce another eminent scholar and friend Sheikh Mohammed Adeyinka Mendez, who's a resident scholar and imam at the Muslim Center of Greater Princeton, New Jersey, and co-founder of the Garden of Knowledge Academy for Arabic and Sacred Sciences. He's a native Ohioan of Yoruba, Brazilian, and African-American ancestry, who also spent his formative years in Lagos, Nigeria, and Houston, Texas. Sheikh Adeyinka embraced Islam at the age of 17 after a life-changing journey to Jerusalem. He studied history at Morehouse College and Arabic and cultural studies at The Ohio State University. He then went on to learn the science of sacred mindfulness and meditation within the Muslim tradition and has been trained for over two decades in the spiritual and scholastic disciplines of Muslim civilization by classical Muslim scholars and academics from around the world. Sheikh Adiyinka is particularly passionate about helping men rediscover their sacred masculinity inspiring youth, empowering women, and uplifting African Americans with knowledge of their vast spiritual, intellectual, and socio-cultural legacy. He is committed to building bridges of peace, hope, and healing between diverse peoples in order to establish a more compassionate, just, and sacred world that our hearts and minds yearn for. He currently resides in New Jersey with his wife and children. Please join me in welcoming Sheikh Mohammed Adyenka Mendez. I'm a little shorter than the last two speakers. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you and the mercy of God and his blessings. Good evening. We begin seeking the blessing and the help of the name of God. And we ask that Allah... God, the divine, the absolute, send blessings and peace upon our leader, Muhammad, and his family, and his companions, and all the prophets and messengers, among them Adam and Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus Christ, the son of the Blessed Mary, and their families and their companions, and the countless prophets and messengers that precede Prophet Muhammad, I thank Allah, I thank God for gathering us here today. Uh, my teachers taught me that whenever you meet someone, that there's a reason, there's a wisdom, there's a meaning to the meeting. And us being here, and I see many familiar faces. Uh, one I didn't even know was here until two seconds ago. Uh, people I've known for some 10, 20 or more years we're gathered here for a, a, a great meaning and to be discussing the life and the legacy of someone like Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba, uh, like Imam Ahmadu Bamba is an auspicious opportunity. And we should really ask ourselves, why are we gathered here at this particular moment in our country's history when we are grappling and dealing uh, with really critical social political and economic issues. Uh, after speaking about God and speaking about the prophets, one of my favorite topics is the life of this man. And I hope to share something with you today about his principles of living and his principles for engaging tyranny and oppression and injustice nonviolently. Now, this story begins with the picture. This is a picture, it's an artist's representation. It's not a photograph 
of the famous story that Dr. Ware referenced, the story of Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba praying on water. We've heard the story of the miracle of Jesus Christ, peace and blessings be upon him, walking on water. And there's a Muslim tradition related by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Allah be pleased with him, that one day these disciples of Christ asked him, how is it that you're able to walk on water? And he said, because I have yaqeen, I have certainty, certainty. And they responded, well, we have certainty too. And then he asked them, are gold and dirt equal in your eyes? Or in our day and age, are dirt and dollars equal in your eyes? And they said, of course not. And he said, that's the difference between me and you. And so Shay Ahmadu Bamba, this miracle, and I don't want to go spend too much time talking about him praying on water because that, you know, you can take it or leave it. You don't have to believe it. But I want to talk about the real miracle in this picture. When I was in Senegal about eight years ago with my wife and uh, our newborn son, we were with Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, TJ Winter. Many of you know him or you've read his works. And Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad was interviewing one of the grandsons of Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba, Sheikh Nalo Njago, who was a great scholar, great linguist. He translated the Quran into Wolof, and uh, you know he's he's done tremendous service to the legacy of Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba. He's also a descendant of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so. Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad is trying to get Sheikh Nalo in this interview that's in the Traveling Light DVD, if, if you've come by it, uh, to talk about his, his great-grandfather's miracle of praying on the water when the French prevented him. And Sheikh Nalo says to him, that's not the miracle. The miracle isn't that my great-grandfather prayed on water. The miracle is that my great-grandfather prayed on time. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, this goes to the essence of who Imam Ahmad Bamba was. He was a person who in every instant was asking, what is God requiring of me? And his praying on the water was simply a response to him living according to the principle that you see here a vow that he took never to offend the children of Adam and never to offend God that the French knew about. And they said to him, we know you don't offend people and you don't offend your God, but we won't let you pray on this boat. They were taking him on the boat to Gabon where he would be in exile for seven years and nine months, the place where no scholar that had been taken to had ever come out alive, ever, Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba was the only one. And so he wasn't going to compromise on something like prayer, and he just threw his goatskin rug off the boat and jumped. He said he didn't know what was going to happen. And he prayed. And then when he finished, he got back on the boat. Why? Because he understood that the sacrifice and the suffering that he was enduring and being exiled was a part of his attaining the spiritual station that my dear friend and brother and teacher, Dr. Ware, so eloquently described to us. He's known as Al-Khadim, not Khadim, but Khadim al-Rasul. Contrary to the practice of you know, giving scholars honorific titles, Alama and the Qutub of this and the Sheikh of, the, of this and the Sheikh of that, the title that Sheikh Abu Bamba preferred was that people call him Al-Khadim, the perpetual servant. 
And this echoes a hadith from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he said, Sayyidul Qawm Khadimuhum, that the master of people is their servant, which has many layers of meaning, of course. Next slide, please. The secret of Shaykh Ahmadu Bamba, like Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is his mother. This is an artist's depiction of his mother. Her name was Maryam Buso. And Maryam Buso was a descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. God bless him and grant, his, grant him peace through his grandson, Al-Hasan. And to this day, if you meet someone who has the last name Buso or Lo, know that in Senegal, they're a descendant of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was a scholar who was the daughter of a woman, Astu, who was a scholar. Shah Amadou Bamba's father, Muhammad, was a judge. He was a Maliki judge in the court of Lachdor. And this woman who passed away when Shah Amadou Bamba was around 10, 11 years old, she inspired him. She used to tell him stories about the saints who would stand in the night. And as a little boy, he literally stood all night. And just stood all night. And then she told him, you're supposed to pray. <laughs> and bow and prostrate, right? She was known for her strength. She was known for her intellect. She had a school. She taught at her mother's school, Sokhna Asato, which is the Senegalese uh, way of saying the colloquial way of saying Aisha, that had about 200 students. His mother, who was known by the nickname Mam Jaratullah, the lady who's the neighbor of God, and we'll come back to this title later on, she was called the neighbor of God because of her scholarship and her piety and her selflessness. She used to walk around Mbake. Jaol, uh, with a copy of the Muhtas al-Khalil, who some of you may know is one of the most advanced. It's a work of legal opinions, legal verdicts in the Maliki school, one of the advanced texts in the school. They describe that she used to walk around town carrying it like a baby, cradling it in her arms. Her mother, Astu, used to wear men's clothing and was described with having a rosary, vicar beads in one hand, and a hoe, a farming hoe in the other. And she ran a whole agricultural project along with her school. You have to understand this to see where she Bamba is coming from. He's coming from a family of industriousness, a family of saintliness, a family of piety. And this poem, which was, it's believed to be one of the first poems he wrote that Dr. Bilal referenced, Sindidi, which is a poem, it's a prayer to God. At the end of the poem, he makes a prayer for his mother. And he says, as you can see here, he says, وَنَجِّنِي وَجَمِيءِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مَعًا وَنَجِّ وَالِدَتِي أَمِينٍ يَا اللَّهُ and save me and all of those who submit entirely along with me and save my, me and my mother. I mean, oh God. So this poem was actually written when he was about 12 to 14 years old and they were in the city of Salom. Why were they in Salom? The, one of the rulers of the time had gathered all of the clerics in the area Maba Jahoba, because he was on a mission to build a coalition against the French. But they displaced the family of Sheikh Amadou Bamba from their ancestral lands. The Mbake had their own town, their own village. And they were moved to Salom. And as a result of that dislocation, 
They were the victim of raids, of abductions. He lost his grandfather. Next slide, please. He lost his grandfather, his uncle, his younger sister, and his mother. They all died when he wasn't even 15 years old yet. She Ahmadu Bamba, he experienced the bitter face, the ugly face of war when he was still a young man. And it turned his heart against slavery, against raids and warfare. And it oriented him towards nonviolence and peace. It shaped him. And when he lost his mother, and you can see in his poetry and his writings, this yearning, this longing for his mother and invoking her memory. Next slide. Sha'amu Dubamba was not interested in establishing a new tariqa, even though he's known by many as being the founder of the Muridiya Tariqa, the Muridiya spiritual order, much like Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, is basically known as the founder of Islam. But just as Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, had his primary mission as reviving the Milla or the way of Abraham, rather than founding a new religion, Ahmadu Bamba's role was to revive the way of Prophet Muhammad And he said here in this poem that's in the work, Jazbu, he says, Ba'da salati la tazulu bil ali wa sahbi al-udulu wa biya jaddil as-sabil bila idan wa la alami. He prays for the Prophet Sallallahu and his family and his companions and he asks Allah to make him among those who renew this way of life, who renew the way of Islam, of loving surrender. But he adds this, bila'idan, without enemies and without harm. You see, there are people, and this is based on a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that has some weakness in it, but the, the, the meaning has been widely accepted and many scholars have written about this hadith that at the head of every 100 years, God will send to this world one who will revive and renew and, and renovate and breathe new life into the religion of Islam. Without that new life, religion becomes fossilized and outdated, we become the slave of tradition and form. And we fall victim to irrelevance. And so Shia Ahmadu Bamba didn't see himself as just a new Sufi master, but as a person who came to breathe this new spirit into Islam. Next slide. So this is probably, for me, the most difficult and the most controversial uh, part of, the, of my presentation. I'm going to share with you lines from one of Sha'amu Dubamba's prayers. And some of the things that you hear might seem uncomfortable, might seem harsh, but I want you to understand what he was going through at this, at this time. As uh, Dr. Ware mentioned, Senegambia, like other parts of the world, were under a brutal French imperialistic agenda. People were being enslaved, people were being killed, people were being imprisoned, resources were being taken, and Sheikh Dubamba found himself in a, a place where he had two, he was given two options. Either you join those who are collaborating with the French. Scholars, Muslim scholars who are using their knowledge, you know, using their influence to support the colonial project, to support modernism and progress 
and the values of egalité, fraternité, liberté, right? fraternity and liberty and, and equality. Or join those scholars like, and those rulers like Maba Ba, who were rising up in armed resistance. Which do you think Ahmed Bamba chose? Neither, neither. He refused to cooperate or collaborate with the French, but he also refused to oppose them violently. And this poem comes at a time when he was being tortured. They attempted, the French attempted to assassinate him because he wouldn't cooperate multiple times. And this was at the time when he was put into the uh, dungeons of Dakar and ultimately on his way to Gabon for seven years. Next slide, please. So the French accused him of being a terrorist, basically. And so he wrote this as a response to say, listen, I'm not a mujahid. I'm not fighting jihad in the sense that you believe. But I am a warrior of sorts. And so I'll just read. He said, my sword, which those who make three gods deceptively fabricate against me, is divine unicity, tawheed. May they perish, those who make three in their error, of the one who possesses neither offspring nor parent. Curses to a people who make partners with Allah and whose penises are uncircumcised, drowning in a sea of arrogance. So I just want need to say something about this because that's not politically correct, right? For Sheikh Ahmed Dubamba, he, he identified three issues that he was critical regarding his oppressors. He said, number one, they had wrong, a wrong relationship with the creator. Number two, they weren't practicing rituals that had been handed down through the prophet. This is the circumcision. And then thirdly, they had a spiritual disease that he identified as arrogance, which is the root of racism which is the root of sexism and other manifestations that we always attempt to legislate away. You cannot legislate away spiritual diseases. Tribalism, nationalism, chauvinism, even certain strands of feminism are rooted in arrogance. Thinking, when, what is arrogance? It is thinking that you're better than others. That you're superior to others. And one other thing about his mentioning they're being uncircumcised. For, for a Muslim and a traditional West African society, circumcision was one of the milestones of one's rites of passage. From childhood into adulthood. And without this rites of passage, people from the Lakota and the Sioux and to the Maori in New Zealand to Jews and Arabs and, and others around the world, indigenous people understand to this day that without a rites of passage, without guiding boys into manhood through journeys of powerlessness and pain, they ultimately end up abusing their power, which is exactly what the French were doing in Senegal, in Algeria, in Syria, in Morocco, and so many other places, and what the English were doing. And they had lost this rites of passage. And secondly, by citing the fact that they were uncircumcised, he was drawing attention to the reality that they had been they had lost a ritual that recalibrates the human being to what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, called their fitrah, their innate, innocent nature. 
So circumcision is not just, and again, I know this is not a very politically correct line, but Shah Obama was not living in an environment of aggressive uh, political correctness, imposed political correctness. Next slide, please. So he talks about his sword, he talks about his shield, he talks about his cannons being the Quran, and he, he uses eloquent language, powerful imagery to describe his relationship with the Quran. And I'm showing you these slides and this prayer that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said was really the only recourse for someone who is powerless. Ad-du'a silah al-mu'min. Supplication is the weapon of the believer. Because the, for the person involved in nonviolent resistance, like Shay Ahmed Bamba, you need to immerse yourself in the legacy and in the heritage of the Quran, of the sayings of the prophets, in embodying them in spiritual transformation. Next slide, please. In this slide, he talks about his spear being the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he praises the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Next slide. In this slide, he talks about how the branches that he depends on for his protection are the secondary sciences that issue forth from the Quran and Sunnah. If we had more time, I would read it for you, and there's, there's, it's, there's a lot of rich symbolism. He talks about his spies being the secrets that he gathers from tasawwuf, what is often called Sufism, which is the science of transforming the human soul. It's the alchemy of happiness. Next slide. And then lastly, he says, by means of tasawwuf from those who hate and harbor rancor, God protects him. So tasawwuf or Sufism is the purification of the soul by embodying beautiful, sublime character that is a reflection of the attributes of God. Embodying the attributes of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and all the prophets before him. In order that the heart can become a receptacle for divine knowledge, for light. And it is that light that raises the human being's vision beyond this world, beyond time and space, and enables them to act in the world, to respond to the challenges of this life without fear and without grief, without fear and without sorrow. Next slide. One of the things that I wanted to share was Sheikh Ahmed Bamba's own words about how his relationship with Allah freed him from needing weapons. A lot of times you mention nonviolence. And people kind of shrug or smirk or what do you mean? But in order to have a successful nonviolent resistance movement, there must be an acknowledgement that God's names and attributes are ultimately what determine history. That causality is under the control of Allah, of, under God. And so in this poem at the beginning, this poem is called Jadbu Qulub, Ila Alamu Ghuyub, the, attract, the attraction of hearts to the knower of the unseen. He says, Hima al hafidhu al mani'i yugni anil madafi'i li kulli abdin khashi'in yatlabu khayrul hurumi. He says, the protection of the hafid, the guardian, the defender from harm, suffices me from needing cannons and guns. Next slide. In another poem, 
Ah, uh, this is the f sanctuary city of Tuba that uh, Dr. Bilal spoke about. It is a city that Shabu Dubamba established for peace and service for all of humanity. He understood, and he didn't just establish one city, there were others. There's Dodu Menan, and he spent his last 15 years in the city of Jurbel. He, like his grandfathers before him, made it his business to not just build masjids, but to build cities, like the Prophet Sallallahu did. The legacy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not just in the rulings that he transmitted, but in the city he left, the people that he built, the bricks of human souls, the doctor we often talks about. And this city that started in a little wooden shack is now the second largest city in the country of Senegal. It's semi-autonomous. It actually, its formation and its establishing in the late 1800s actually precedes the establishment of Senegal. Next slide. Sheikh Ahmadou Bamba, also his understanding of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu it focused on the Battle of Badr as being the turning point and the people of Badr as being the pinnacle of saintliness in their sacrifice. And he saw the Battle of Badr not just as an example of how a small group could have victory over a large group, a group that was outgunned and outmanned, could have overwhelming success on the battlefield through divine aid. He also saw it as a ransom, as a sacrifice that freed later generations of Muslims from having to fight battle. I'll read for you his statement. He says, it's a little easier for me to read up here. He says, radiallahu anhu, بذلك اليوم حصل لنا أمان من وجل ومن عناء وخجل ومن جوا وندم به غنينا الجنان عن غزوة وعن هوان به لنا طاب الزمان مع القبول الخدم he says that on the day of Badr, we were saved from humiliation. We were saved from uh, cowardice. And it is on that day that we attain safety and freedom. And that day suffices us, the Muslim community, from needing to take up arms in battles in Ghazwa. It's a unique understanding of history. And it is shared by a few other scholars, like Muhammad bin Ali al-Alawi, the great scholar from southern Yemen, and Sheikh Musa Kamara, who is also from the Senegambian region, region. But the understanding that Badr was not only a great victory for the people who were there, but it was a victory for Muslims to the Day of Judgment that paid the price of needing to shed blood so that we would not need to shed blood again. Next slide, please. Shamud Bamba had supporters who disagreed, though. One of his supporters from among the spiritual aspirants who had numerous students behind them asked if they should launch a holy war. And this is, these are not my words. These are the words of Dr. Ahmed Perzada. A just war against the French until death or the achievement of victory. Ahmad Dubamba replied to this proposition, I do not hope for the support of any friend, nor do I fear the aggression of any enemy. I am entirely submitted to God. It's this commitment 
to preserving human life and human dignity. And Shia Mudubamba's pact with the Prophet ﷺ that, as we'll see again, was the source of his nonviolent philosophy. Next slide. In this poem, وَكَانَ حَكَنْ عَلِينَ نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And it's, it's, it's a right upon us to help the believers. Right? This is, these are words taken from the Qur'an. And this is an acrostic poem. Shaykh Abu Dubamba loved to write acrostic poems. Poems that take letters. So you see the letters, those of you who can read Arabic or Persian or Urdu, the letter Wow, Kaf, Alif, Noon, Ha, Qaf, Alif, Ayn, Lam, Ya, Noon, Alif, all the way to the end. What he would do is he would write a line of poetry for each letter. So you could, it would actually spell the ayah or spell the name of God or the name of the Prophet Sallallahu vertically. And one of my teachers told me that he was in fact giving you a commentary on each letter. All right. So in this particular poem, he says at the end, لِأَوْسِلِ الَّذِي أُرِيدُ وَأَنْفَعِي بِيَ الْوَرَى يَا مُغْنِيًا عَنِ الْمِنْفَعِي He said, to me, grant that which I seek, that which I desire, and benefit through me all of creation. Shah Mudubamba is not just for people who are murids or bayfal or for Senegalese or... He asked that Allah make his life a benefit for humanity. And free me, make me independent from needing cannons and guns. Next slide. He was known as prisoner number four when he was in Gabon. He took great pride in that. Because four in Arabic numerology is the numerical value of the letter dal in the abjad. Right. And Surah Al-Ikhlas, the 112th or 111th chapter of the Quran, we won't go there tonight, ends in this letter. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ قُلْهُ وَلَوْ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ صَمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ All ends in each ayah, each line ends in the letter Dal. So he saw the letter Dal, the number four, as the number and as the letter of divine oneness. Because the chapter of Ikhlas, the 112th chapter of the Quran, is the chapter of the Quran that summarizes the reality of God. And so these quotes from Sha'amu Dubamba highlight Again, his state. When I think of this dungeon and of the authority of the time, I think of undertaking armed struggle at all costs. But the one who effaces all sins, al-mahi, which is one of the attributes of the Prophet Wasallam, forbade me from doing so. And this is the instance that Dr. Ware referred to where he balled up his fist. On that night, he said he wanted to wage jihad. But Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said, appeared to him in a vision and stopped him. So his approach to nonviolence was very different than that of Dr. King or, or Gandhi. It came from his spiritual, his mystical experience and re relationship with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He used to tell his disciples, his students that he have been given the secret of the verse that God has protected me. Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas And this was the same ayah that Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, over a thousand years earlier, when it was revealed to him, he told all of the bodyguards that he had, all the guards to leave. Next, next slide, please. And this is the, the next... Qasida we'll look at, it's called Jawartu. Jawartu Allah bi kitabi. I became the neighbor of God through his book. So again, he's, re, he's calling back, he's remembering his mother, who was known as Jawartu Allah, the neighbor of God. 
he wrote this poem, and it's a short prayer poem, and it's often recited by those who study the works of Shabbat Bamba when people pass away because it relates to one being in the presence of God, becoming literally the neighbor of God through giving up this physical, material envelope, envelope that we're wearing. And at the end of this poem, again, he says, تَذِيلُ مَا ثَبَتَ لِلْمُشَفَّعِي أَغْنَى عَنْ يَمِينِ عَنْ أَذَنْ وَمِدْفَعِي he says, my following, that which is established by the intercessor, referring to Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, it suffices me, literally my right hand, from causing harm and from needing weapons. So he's giving guidance that if you're going to tread this path of nonviolence, and remember, if you, look, if you reflect on the last quote, he recognized the legitimacy of self-defense. He himself was going to take up arms in self-defense against the French. But his spiritual station prevented him from doing that. And that spiritual station was based on his following in his words, following in his deeds, following in his character, and following in his, his approach to God, his spiritual wayfaring, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Next slide. On the next slide, we look at the way of the servant, Al-Khadim. The mantra to this day, and I, I can't say it in Wolof, I'm not fluent in Wolof like my brother, but to this day, the mantra of those who follow these teachings is work, worship, discipline. And when you go to Tuba, you see these three words embodied in the men, the women, the boys, and the girls in that city. There is an understanding that you don't need to rely on anyone else to provide for your needs. It's the dignity of working with your own hands, with your own mind, that should be your reliance. That the human being is not just here on the planet to make profit. But the human being is here to worship God. And it is through that worship that we cultivate our souls and that we expand and that we grow. And these two things, work and worship, can't be done without discipline. Shaykh Ahmed Bamba taught a Quranic consciousness. Don't just memorize the Quran. But do you see the world through the lens of the Quran? Do you think Quranically? Is your character Quranic? He was, the, he was the head teacher of his father's school. And when his father passed away, the great judge, he had a, a, a dream of the Prophet Wasallam, And the Prophet Wasallam, he said, came to him and told him, no longer teach your students merely through books, but teach them, teach them through him, through spiritual focused energy and aspiration. And the next day he came out to his students and said, all of those who want to learn the traditional sciences and the rational sciences, you can go to my brother so-and-so and go to my brother so-and-so and go to my brother so-and-so. But those who want God... Stay. Most of the people got up and left. And they left him with just a few students who weren't seeking knowledge that doesn't lead to awareness of the divine presence. But it is with those students that he built his movement. It is with those students that he established the semi-autonomous city of Tuba. It is with those students that this wave of love and knowledge and service continues to grow to this day. I'm going to skip some of these. I was going to talk about the Dara and the Da'ira. The Dara is, 
is the, the spiritual center, the school uh, that is a place for communal living and gathering and education. The diet as a council. Uh, he, he emphasized working on the, on the earth, agronomy, and developing uh, products from that. And he liberated, just like Gandhi liberated the Indians from depending on British salt, Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba did the same thing by helping the, the Senegalese liberate their dependence on French sugar and French coffee. If you're calling people to nonviolence and you're not showing them how to live without depending on the person or on the system that is oppressing them, then you're leaving them to be vulnerable. You're leaving them weak. And this is what I think, this is one of the things that is missing from the modern peace movement. This is one of the things that's missing from the calls we hear to non-proliferation and the calls we hear to stop the violence in certain communities. And, and you never hear people talking about training and teaching people to stand on their own feet so that they can live as free human beings in our world. Shamal Dubamba understood how important this was. And this coffee, which is delicious, by the way, if you have not had any, is there a Tuba Cafe tonight? How can we, you have to... Every, you got everything else right. We should have had Tuba Cafe flowing. His daras, these spiritual centers, were self-sustaining centers. They didn't just get together to meet, read Quran and memorize Quran and recite the names of God and do dhikr. They were self-sufficient. And one of his acts of civil disobedience against the French is that he commanded all the daras not to pay taxes to the French. So under this scholar's understanding of the needs of his people and what was necessary for their dignity and their liberation, I think gives us today quite a bit of, quite a bit to think about. And then doing no harm. Next slide. He sent this letter to his students before his second exile. So after seven years in, Morit in, in Gabon, he came back for a short while and then the French saw that his followers, his movement was even stronger than when he had left seven years ago. And so they decided to send him to Mauritania where the Arabs had a historical relationship of being the teachers and the masters of the Senegalese. So they thought if we send him to Mauritania, they'll contain him. And not only that, he will be humbled by the knowledge of the Shanakita of the Mauritanians. He went to Mauritania, and what do you think happened? They became his students. They became his students, and he stayed there for five years. But before he left, he wrote this to his students to guide them. To not say or do anything harmful, because he understood the repercussions on his community and the people. It wasn't just about political correctness for him. It was a particular principle of living. It was a code of living, doing no harm to anyone, whether they're a Muslim or Jewish or Christian. I have one minute and we have to skip a couple slides. Next slide. Maybe another time we'll go over this project that's going on today. This is a Sheikh uh, Ali Indo, he's a mathematician by, by profession, but his work now is with the hoe that you see in the back, cultivating land and, and projects. Oh, go back. Next slide. Okay. That's Logan, who is here, I think, uh, one of the hub scholars. And these are some of the initiatives that Sheikh Ali and Doe and his students have been leading in order to make these teachings of Sheikh Amadou Bamba relevant in the modern day. 
Okay, next slide. So I, I want to bring it full circle, and I have, I may go over just a couple of minutes, because I really, I want to end with this. Sheikh Ali Ndo's analysis of Sheikh Ahmed Obama's life ends with his forgiveness of the French. Just like Prophet Muhammad, God bless his soul, just like Prophet Joseph, Yusuf, peace be upon him, in the Bible, in the Quran, their stories end with their forgiving, in the case of Prophet Muhammad, his people, the Quraysh. There's no hardship upon you today. Go, you're free. Go, you're forgiven. And what Joseph, Prophet Joseph, peace and blessings rest upon him, what he said to his brothers. Go, you're forgiven. And for each and every one of you in your respective lives and stories, the final stage needed for your own spiritual growth and transcendence is to forgive those who have harmed you. Whether they're a government or a relative or an employer, it's to grow into that forgiveness. And so he wrote this. He used to write letters to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he used to write letters, and this is one of them. As for what follows, I'm, I've accepted and am happy with total sufficiency with God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm certain of your promise, the promise that Dr. Ware referred to, which there is no doubt in its fulfillment for me. Now and hereafter, in the lowest world and in the heavenly garden, promised to the reverent, the people of God consciousness, bear witness that I have shown compassionate love upon those who exiled me and will not implore the most exalted with supplications against them, like the supplication we read at the beginning. He said, from this day onward, I will do no such thing ever again. And Someone like Shamud Obama, you definitely don't want him praying against you. Trust me. <laughs> and I've intended all past supplications against him to be counted as elevating the word of God. Next slide. And then this is a prayer that he wrote to God himself. Oh God, through all of your names and through the right of your most noble essence, through which you answered me, this is the response. Blessings and peace rest upon our leader and master Muhammad and his family and companions bear witness that I have pardoned the Christians who exiled me and other than them from humanity. For I have beseeched you through the right of your noble essence that no enemy will approach me with that which hurts me, nor anything that harms me until I enter the heavenly garden promised to the reverend. So this is how he ends his life. And he wrote this while he was still under house arrest. He spent 33 years of his life either in exile or under house arrest. And this was his definition of nonviolence and peace. That there does not remain in your heart hatred for others. You cannot have nonviolence without that. Last slide. This is, again, another famous hagiographical moment in his life when the French put him in a room with a lion that had been starved. This is one of their ways, this, this was one of their ways of getting rid of people. And those who are present narrate that when he went into the room, they expected to hear the lion tearing him to shreds, but they heard nothing. So this is an artist's depiction of that moment. And Shah Ahmed Bamba, he said, and I think this quote really sums up his approach to nonviolence. Because it's more than just a strategy. It's more than just a tactic. It is about a state of being. That there must be no violence in your heart. Not even an atom, he said. Not even an atom. And that takes training. That takes work. That takes polishing. That takes education. That takes illumination. 
once a person is free of the violence within themselves, then they cannot, their being cannot be harmed by violence. Yes, you may be beaten as Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was beaten. Yes, you may be exiled, but who you are, the light, the soundness of your soul is never sullied. So thank you so much. May Allah bless you all, and I look forward to your questions. And may Allah help us, may Allah grant us the success to respond to the challenges of our time with clarity and from a place of spirit, not a place of expediency or comfort that sacrifices our principles. Thank you so much for listening. So I, I think you mentioned um, Sheikh Adienka. Bamba tried to avoid both African rulers and the French colonial administrators and, and rulers because he seemed to feel that other scholars sacrificed their autonomy and dignity when they curried favor at the court. Uh, it, it was more important to be with and in service of the people than those with power. And, and in this regard, he, there seems to be a, a similarity with Mohidin Shishti, uh, and, and dare I say, uh, Imam Hussein, Zainab, and even Jesus. So, yeah. so what, what does that stance tell us? Uh, what, should it, what should it inform us today? Uh, how, how should it inform our, our behavior, our actions? Well, I just want to say two things about that. First of all, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba's spiritual uh, archetype was Christic. It was based on the archetype of Christ, of the Messiah. Peace and blessings be upon him and his blessed mother Mary. And so you see this thread, you know, that connects Imam Ali, Imam Al Hussein, Jesus Christ, and Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, and others like them who understood the the necessity of taking a stand, even when you know you're not guaranteed temporal victory. So Imam Al Hussein. You know, he took a stand at Karbala, knowing he was outnumbered, knowing that he had women and children with him, right? To establish for all of history that there is a responsibility to not cooperate and not be silent when injustice and tyranny is taking place. The second thing is, I think, we have to realize Sheikh Ahmed Obama was not reacting. His response to the French and his response to the traditional African chiefs and kings that were around him and the scholars. So you had, you had three other elements. There were the French colonial powers. There were the traditional Muslim scholars, most of whom were working with and for the French. And then you had these political rulers, these chiefs and kings who just wanted to expand their, uh, their kingdoms and their territories. He wasn't re responding to them. We have to, it's really important. He was not reacting. He simply wanted to establish a place, a space where he could worship God freely, where he could devote himself to the Prophet Wasallam. God bless him and grant him peace. And, 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 that, and that is what put him in opposition. It wasn't him saying, oh, I don't want to, you know, necessarily collaborate or I don't want to sacrifice the lives of my people, so I'm not going to respond in, in military combat. He just wanted to be, like he said in the poem, Inni ujahidu abdan khadiman. Inni ujahidu bin ulumi wa tuku abdan khadiman. He saw his identity, first and foremost, was not based on his tribe. It was not based on his gender. It was not based on the color of his skin. His identity was based on his spiritual being. And I think there's a lot we can learn from that.
You, I know you're itching there's, to say there's a yeah. There's a story that illustrates the point that you were making, so I was itching to tell it. Um, the, the story is um, about when Bamba was called to come to serve as the chief Qadi at the court when his father had passed away. And Bamba politely refused because he was really not interested in getting involved in politics. He wanted to focus on building good human beings instead of you know, reaching for power. So he responded politely with polite refusals to come serve as the, the, the chief Qadi. And finally, um, they kept asking him and he got impatient. So the way that the story goes is that the, um, he sends a letter to the king's um, uh, uh, scribe, who also happens to be his former poetry teacher. Um, so the Majah the, Khatekala, the, the scribe, opens the letter and starts to read it to the king. He greets you with peace. And then he said, oh, I'm not going to read this. Um, he said something that's offended me. He said, well, what does the, the king say? So what did the letter say? He said, no, no, it personally offends me. I'm not going to read what, you know, what Bamba said. He said, I'm your king. I command you to read the letter. He said, after the greetings of peace, he um, continues with an aphorism from Muhammad ibn Maslama that says that the person of knowledge who curries favor at the court of a sultan is like a fly feeding on a pile of feces. <laughs> so the king says to him, I don't know what you're so upset about. He's comparing you to a fly. He's calling me a pile of... <laughs> the, the, the point was is that Bamba's approach to, to politics was to say, my, it is not my affair. Leave the world to the worldly. And, and that was what frustrated, exactly. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. I ain't about that. Um, I'm, I'm about, you know, teaching God's word and, and fixing the hearts of the children of Adam. Thank you. I'd like to ask you another question because the experience that I've had with Murids, Senegalese uh, scholars and, and, and students is one of, of, of great uh, tolerance this this sense of of accepting people from all all religions all races all genders and and yet we don't hear a lot about that and and so in addition to bomba there's this this wonderful scholar tierno bokar can can professor where would you like to speak about how he would inculcate this this virtue of of, of religious tolerance and 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 in the face of of receiving hostility from others show show great acceptance and uh, Sheikh Mendez can also, because actually the day we met, you were speaking about Cherno Bokar Salif Tal a number of years ago. Um, the, the, I, I would just, to, to keep the, the response brief, um, I would point people to a talk that I gave that you can find on YouTube that's called Principles of Pacifism and Traditions of Tolerance in West African Islam, where I expand on this uh, at some length. But to, to, for Cherno Bokar Salif Tal, who was an amazing scholar, very similar um, in disposition to Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Um, he had that same kind of basic understanding of um, humanity. He described um, following the, the structure of the Hadith of Jibril, which talks about progression from Islam, Iman, to Ihsan. He said, faith is of three kinds, um, solid faith, liquid faith, and ethereal faith. Solid faith is suitable for the masses. It's firm and immovable like mountains. Liquid faith, however, erodes the rocks of intolerance. It fills whatever receptacle it finds itself in. It can start out as a mighty ocean and then narrow itself into a stream to get through a pass, and then it pours out again into a bountiful ocean. He said, so it's more, it's, it, it's paradoxically stronger than solid faith. Ethereal faith is the faith that rises to the heavens, where you know only truth without shape or color or form. And that corresponds to the state of Ihsan. So if you have that faith that is always striving for that higher level, um, simple, uh, solid faith that's rooted in affirming your identity um, won't be enough for you anymore. Just like simple performance of the prayers will not be enough for you. You instead have to have Iman penetrate your heart. And once that happens, that won't be enough for you. You have to have Ihsan, that 24-hour surveillance camera on your heart at all times so that you're not causing harm to anyone. And just to, oh, the last image was uh, Bamba, the, the no harm. And this actually goes right to that point. There's a famous... Uh, story about a disciple that came to Bamba asking him for a talisman for protection. And he said, you want a talisman? He's, the, the man said, yeah. He said, I'll give you the best talisman. 
bul def ken lu bon bul wax ken lu bon bul yene ken lu bon cause harm to no one speak ill of no one form no evil intentions towards anyone if you are capable of these three, any evil intentions anyone will formulate against you will fall back upon them. That's your talisman. It's like the blackbirds like and the white birds that Turtle Brooker talks about. Begaladik. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Turtle Brooker's metaphor of faith, he, it's really important because he didn't, he saw two religions really. There were people who believed in God and people who rejected God. Those were the two families of humanity. And among the people who believed in God, there were Muslims, there were Jews, there were Christians, there were Hindus, there were, you know, all kinds of forms. And he really called for people to seek truth through the tradition that they had received and when God guided them to something more elevated, to surrender to that. And the point that Trinal Booker made about people who are at the solid level of faith is that these are the people who only see truth as being with them alone. They look at the world as us versus them. The people with liquid faith are people who can connect dots and they see truth in other traditions. They see truth in other religions while staying true to the form and the tenets of their own path. And those who had ethereal faith were those who could not own, who had transcended and become, he says, formless and were not only able to see truth in the teachings of other traditions, but others were able to see truth in them. It's really high. And, uh, but I just, the last thing I want to say is that what you see with Cherno Bokar, uh, with Sheikh Ahmed Bamba and others like them, Sheikh Hassan Sise and, you know, these great scholars is a school that was started many, many, many hundreds of years ago and was crystallized by someone called Imam Had Salim Suare and who codified what is known uh, as the Suwarian tradition. He lived around the 12th, 13th century and he really embodied certain tenets that were spread throughout West Africa. And so what you're reading whether it's from a Churro Bokar or whether it's from a Sheikh Ahmadou Bamba or, or a Sheikh Uthman Danfodio or Had Salem Suwari's teachings that every human being is like a flower that blossoms at a time when God chooses, not when you choose. Right? And because of that, there's an empathy towards human beings, no matter where they are in their spiritual journey, no matter what their religion is, there's a recognition that when God guides that person. Thank you, Thank you Sheikh. So I'll, I'll ask one more question and then open it up to the audience for a, a couple of questions. It seems, and we spoke about this earlier before the event, that, that all forms of, of xenophobia are, are connected, that they're related to, to Ignorance and arrogance, whether it's uh, the, the sense of racism of, of whites being better than blacks or vice versa, or men and women, or Sunni Shi, et cetera. Uh, can, what would you like to tell the, the audience? Give us something practical. How can we uproot this, this ignorance and arrogance? It's the most uh, important and fundamental question of our time. Um, I'll begin with the answer that Bamba gives in Masalik al Janan, which is also translated in, in Jihad of the Pen. Um, kibr, uh, istikbar, um, arrogance or pride, is um, at the heart of, as Sheikh Mendez mentioned, racism. It's the belief that you're better. So, what Bamba says in Masalik al Janan is never forget that it was kibr that brought low the cursed Iblis. 
We seek refuge in Allah from both of them, Iblis and pride. The cure is to contemplate your body and how it was created. You begin your life as a nasty drop of sperm. You live your life as a walking sack of feces. And you end your life as a corpse, odious and rotting. You are all the children of Adam. And it is from dirt that you were created. That's what Bamba says in Masalik al Janan. And what he's reminding the human being is that a creature that's made out of dirt in its fitra is not going to rank itself as superior to another creature that's made out of dirt. This problem of racism or of chauvinism or of ethnic pride in all its various forms is an attack from the shaitan. It's not part of you. It's the shaitan's effort to get you to see one another with the same kind of contempt that he has for your whole species. When you see the expression of racism or even religious pride that causes people to condemn people of other faiths, know that what you are seeing is the true satanic religion. That is the creed that he has been on, and he's the first racist in history because when he is commanded to bow to that which God made with his own two hands, he says, I'm better than him. My origin and my bodily substance, I'm made from fire, he's made from clay, I ain't bowing. He is the one who taught us this sin, and he is the one who causes us to persist in this sin. So it, just as the Sheikh said, there is no sociological engineering that is capable of uprooting a spiritual illness until we have an appropriate diagnosis for the problem of racism and ethnocentrism and so chauvinism and even the religious chauvinism within our, our com own community. We are incapable of providing benefit to anyone because we can't keep from harming ourselves. I, I would just add, uh you know, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, following in Imam Ghazali's tradition, for these spiritual diseases, he gives what he calls the knowledge cure mm. and then the practical cure. And I think one of the practical cures for arrogance that's really at the root of so much of the dysfunction that we see in our world today is that a person should rush to communities that historically they have dominated, that they have historically controlled, that historically there's been a power differential and they should put themselves in the humble service of others. Sheikh Uthman Danfodio says you should force yourself to do humble acts of service for others until it becomes natural until it becomes part of your khuluq, your character. Because the, the, the textbook definition of character is how you respond regardless of circumstance. Patient perseverance is the, what happens at the first blow. It's how you respond to a calamity or a trial at the first instance. So I don't, we know you can, each person, you just, you know, look at your own situation. Look at your history. Whether you are Latino or Latina, whether you're African American, whether you are white American, whether you're Asian, whether you're Senegalese or Nigerian or Malaysian in here, wherever you're from, look at your history, look at your family, who historically, who traditionally have your people had enmity with, right? Uh, Hindus and Muslims or Sikhs and Muslims or you know, whites and blacks, and then go to the community of those people and eat with them. Invite them into your home. Learn from them. Learn their history. See if there's some kind of intersection between your history and, and, and their story. Look for points of commonality and common ground and appreciate and understand the differences and the distinctions. We're not looking for a colorblind society. We want to see the colors of the rainbow. Right. And I think if we did more of that, 
and, and just assume, you know, Imam Ghazali says, when someone, and I'll stop here, I'm, I'm, when someone is, you know, spreading nasty rumors about you, and they're always, you know, false, aren't they, right? They're never true. When someone's spreading rumors about you, slandering you, you know what he says you should do? Assume they're right. And act as if you are stingy or you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, corrupt or unjust. Whatever they're saying about you, assume it to be true and get to work on yourself. That's spirituality. It's so much more than, you know, burning incense and wearing nice oud and reading bad translations of Rumi, right? <laughs> spirituality is working on yourself. It's doing what's uncomfortable and it is humbling yourself to people that otherwise you might think you shouldn't go to the parts of town that you usually don't go to. Not, not to just, um, you know, do a fundraiser or give, write a check. No, go to those places to elevate and to uplift and to enrich. And I'm not just talking about people in the suburbs going to, in, to the inner city because we're all hurting. We're all suffering. People in the, I, I'm an imam in the suburbs. There are people in the suburbs that are hurting. They need people from the inner cities or from the rural communities to come and bring healing. And there are people in the suburbs that need to bring healing to the inner cities and to the rural communities. So, inshallah, if, if we do some of those things, I think, and we're, we commit to it. It's not something you do in one month or one year. This is, you know, it takes time, you know. But the human soul is so malleable, and, and at the root of it is there's so much goodness. If we, if we persist, that goodness will, will, will find it at the, at the end of the day, inshallah. If I could take the liberty, Sheikh Mendez is characteristically generous um, in his picture. I'm going to be characteristically pointed yes. about going to the uh, wrong side of town. This is something that I've said to probably two dozen different Muslim students associations over the course of the years. Is um, I'm the son of a locksmith with a sixth grade education. Y'all come see me now because I got a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. But I was I, ne I was evicted. Um, we never finished a lease at any place that I lived before I was seven years old. Um, and if any of y'all had come to my house with hot food on any of those nights that we went to bed without anything to eat, I would have read anything that you had, and I would have gone with you anywhere you were trying to go. But you didn't go then, and you're not going now. Mm because you're too busy trying to convert Becky and Tom and people in the suburbs and you're interested in performing middle-class respectability. Um, the religion that many of our communities follow is capitalism. Islam is our ritual observance. The sunnah that matters the most to us is middle-class respectability and occasionally conspicuous, uh, conspicuous consumption. And that until we follow the prophetic methodology and reach out to the poorest and the meekest and the blackest of us, then we're not about anything and God will forbid any good from coming of any of our efforts, period. I'd like to open it up to the audience to ask a couple of questions. Um, so my question is, um, Kind of similar to the last couple of words um, that were just spoken. And, you know, our society is um, very much a consumer-based society right now. And coming, living in a developing, developed nation, also coming from a developing nation, I, I see how we consume without really being conscious of what we're doing. And, you know, I wanted to kind of talk and... Um, maybe just hear what you guys have to say about, um, you know, our consumption of products and goods and animals that kind of um, are living in cruel conditions or the fact that, you know, we know that the earth is being destroyed, deforestation and global warming and also animal cruelty at all time high as well and teaching, you know, love and compassion for all living things, and how how do we in our consumer-based society 
and being unconscious to a lot of these realities that exist today and just consuming blindly, how do we kind of, how do we show love to even the smallest creatures, insects, plants, um, all the way up to, you know, the cattle, the fish, um, trees, every, everything, you know, everything that's living. It's a, it's a beautiful question. It's an, a really important question. Um, so there's two short answers to it uh, that I would give. Um, the first is that capitalism is a religion. It's a, 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 a comprehensive system of beliefs and practices, and it's fundamentally incompatible with Islam. It's a competing religion. And if you don't understand it as such, um, then you haven't read Quran. Um, that's number one. Um, and live with that, Americans, um, and understand that you have to struggle against the totalitarian, uh, transcendent religious logic of consumption. And where it comes from is, uh, takes us back. So uh, when Iblis is commanded, before Iblis is commanded to bow, so in the time between the, the, fr the molding of Adam with the two hands, um, the frame of, and before the breathing of the breath, the frame of Adam is propped outside of the garden for the exegetes say either seven years or 40 years or 70 years or 40,000 years or 70,000 years, God knows best. But what the shaitan used to do, they all say, is that he would throw pebbles. That's why we stone him back. Um, he would throw pebbles at the form of Adam. And when he heard it clink, this clay form, he said, this thing's hollow. So he would fly in through the mouth, swim around the insides and come out the anus. And he said, it is hollow. It's gonna spend all its days trying to fill the emptiness that's inside it. If, I'm ever, uh, if it's ever given power over me, that's how I'm gonna break it. The point of the story is that human beings have this innate emptiness in us that we constantly try to fill through consumption and the shaitan knows this weakness in us. So he is the author also of this system that has us thinking that we constantly need more and if that we have more and if we just get a little more of this and a little more of that, things will be better. But the child of Adam will never be satisfied by gratifying a need. They'll only want more. Contentment comes with having taslim and accepting that which God has given you and being content with it. And that whatever is in your hands of good or of wealth, distributing it to the people in service to pay a ransom for your soul when you leave this place. The, the, um, this story of Satan May God protect us from him and Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. This is our story. It's each and every one of your stories. And what is the story? The story is that Satan, Iblis, for those of you who may not be Muslim or you're not familiar with this term for the devil, his ruse is to make the human being think, to make you and I think that our happiness, our immortality, our kingdom is something outside of us. Mm. This is what happened with our parents, Adam and Eve, peace and blessings be upon them. Shaitan, Satan, is telling them, do you want a kingdom that will never perish? Do you want immortality? Eat from this tree. What do you mean? God already blew his own, from his own spirit into Adam. He already had immortality. So this is where hyperconsumption, it stems from this desire of the human being. Like as, as Dr. Ware said, it stems from this desire of the human being to attain fulfillment and contentment, but it, it won't happen through something outside of yourself. Your happiness, your contentment, your peace, your joy can only be discovered from within. Why is that? Because the human being is not 
only a body. When Satan examined the human being for those years, it was before the spirit was blown into Adam. He missed that. You see, you are matter, but you're also spirit. The matter that you're made of is relative, it's contingent, and it's incli it inclines towards these you know, items and objects that we consume. But the spirit, the light, the consciousness, the, the uh, divine breath that animates this matter is absolute. And it's only satisfied by the one who is absolute, God himself. So that's just like the... That's what's going on psychologically, and that's what's going on at the level of, of you know, the, you know, what we're made of. How do we combat it, right? That's your question, right? How do we combat it? There's a, there's a principle in Thib, in Islamic, the Islamic healing tradition, that the cure of a thing is in its opposite, right? We learned that back in the day, right, Musa, right? From Sheikh Muhammad Sharif. The cure of a thing is in its opposite. The cure for hyperconsumption is that each and every one of us have something that you make with your hands. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he said that the, the best provision that a human being can eat from is that which he or she makes with their hands. And Prophet David, King David, Peace and blessings be upon him. He was a king. He was a prophet. He used to eat from the provision of his hands. So even if you're an imam or a professor and your job is based a lot on what you do with your mind and your tongue, you should still have things you do with your hands. Just honest, hard craftsmanship transforms the soul. And our crafts, and our craftsmen and women are dying. And one of the solutions, we talked about this when we were in Fez City, right? One of the solutions to the problem you're talking about and the many others is reviving these crafts, reviving this, um, this culture of, of production and cultivation. That's just one thing. And there are many others, but I don't want to be long. I think we have time for one more question. Take your time, brother. I'm sure this question isn't worth your time, but I'm not, but I'm just curious, like Curious George the monkey, so. Look, anything you say or do is worth our time. We are honored that you are here. Really, I'm not just saying that. We are honored that you're here on a Saturday night, and so please don't, don't uh, diminish okay. who you are or what you're about to say. So what got you into Sheikh Bamba? As a kid, did you do any biologies on him, um, biography papers on him? And if your classmate would ask him why you did him, what do you, what would, what do you think you would say to them? That's a great question. <laughs> Mashallah. Mashallah. Um, I'll try to be brief in telling one of my favorite stories. Um, I went to Senegal in 1996 uh, for the first time as an undergraduate. Um, uh, I had converted to Islam when I was 15 years old, and by this time my Islam was hanging on by a thread because of the way that American Muslims had treated me as a young black man. Um, I barely prayed. Um, my heart was dying. and. Um, I was buying a pair of bootleg Air Jordan sneakers from a street vendor in downtown Dakar. And he had a picture of Ahmed Ubamba on a necklace around his neck. And even though I hadn't prayed in probably like two weeks, um, I was like, why you got a picture of another person around your neck if you're a Muslim? What, you know, what do you need a sheikh for? What do you need, who, what's the, so special about you know, this person? I did the whole Salafi trip, you know. Um, <laughs> Again, hadn't prayed in a couple weeks. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Salafi trip and the not praying thing are not incompatible. That's another story. We can't even do that tonight. But I'm gonna tell, let me just finish this one. So uh, he said, yeah, I hear that kind of thing from Americans, um, you know, from, from uh, Westerners a lot, but especially Americans. Maybe it's that whole all men are created equal thing that makes you, you know, think that you don't need a guide to get to God. <laughs> he said, and it's a nice thing to say, but we all know it's not true. He said, take these Air Jordans. <laughs> they, were, they were sending somebody to get my size because they didn't have my size, so we had time to talk. So he said, um, take these Air Jordans. Um, you play, I've seen you, you play pickup basketball at the university sometimes, right? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, no matter how much you practice at basketball, you'll never be as good at basketball as Michael Jordan because some people just have innate natural gifts for basketball. You're a student, right? I was like, yeah. Well, let's say you're studying physics. You'll never be as good at physics as Albert Einstein because some people have innate natural gifts for physics. He says, so if it's the case that some people have innate natural gifts for sport and some people have innate natural gifts for um, uh, science, then shouldn't it also be the case that some people have innate natural gifts for spirituality? This one that you see around my neck was one of those who was gifted with innate natural gifts for spirituality. So instead, <laughs> so we follow after him and listen to his teachings. And it helps us get to know the God that sent him better. That's it. That was when I was hooked on Ahmed Obama. Yeah, just to, to respond to your question. If I was writing that paper, what uh, grade are you in? Sixth grade? Wow, nice. All right, middle school. If I was writing that paper, uh, the reason why I'm in love with uh, Sheikh Ahmed Obamba is because, there's really two reasons. Number one, I think that he shows us a very practical way to repair our world that does not cause more trauma, that does not cause more hurt, that does not cause more pain. And the issues that he dealt with are the issues that every American, every European, every African, every Asian, every person that I'm aware of deal with today. He dealt with all the things that we're facing. And then secondly, as a, as a, as a black man, Ahmed Dubamba, it's, it's like you have, it's almost like you have the qualities of Jesus Christ. I was, I was raised in a Christian family before I became Muslim. The qualities of Prophet Muhammad, the qualities of Malcolm X, the qualities of Martin Luther King, you know, the, all in one person. And so that, to me, is, is really attractive. You know, you have someone who, and to this day, I mean, whenever I, I read about him or, or reflect and contemplate his life, this is a person who loved people so much. And I don't think, you know, and I... I Sometimes it brings me to tears to think how much Sheikh Ahmed loved human beings. And when I reflect on the fact that he, his love for humanity is just a drop compared to Prophet Muhammad's Sallallahu love for humanity. I mean, I, it, it's mind-boggling. But this person loved, like Cherno Bokar, these people, they loved humans so much even though that love was not reciprocated. And for many of us, we haven't learned that lesson yet. We only do good to those who do good to us. We only love those who treat us well. But not Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, not Shia Ahmed Obamba, not Cherno Bokar. They loved human beings because they know that human beings are beloved to God. And to me, that's the greatest lesson, you know. And, and as Dr. Ware said, to express that love ultimately 
through serving others, to helping others, and, and not looking for accolades, not looking for compensation, for a check, for money, but just to help people, to help the planet, to, to be of service to animals even, just because it's good to be good. It's the right thing to do. I, I think that's a valuable lesson. And, and I'm, I'm in love with Shevon de Bamba for that reason, because his life so clearly makes that apparent. So are you going to write the paper? Are you, are you going to write the paper? I hope you do. Inshallah. The, excellent. Inshallah. May Allah bless you. Unbelievable. Thank you. It's one thing. Mashallah. Allah bless you. I just, just want to say one thing. I promised my wife I would do this. And I'm only here with her permission. Uh, my wife, Roke Yaqub, just authored a children's uh, coloring storybook about the life of Sheikh Ahmad Dubamba called The Sage of Senegal. There are some copies outside. It's, and I'm not saying this because she's my wife, but it is, as far as I know, the best coloring book about a Muslim scholar that I've seen. Uh, and she did a lot of research, uh, more research than I thought you needed to do a children's coloring book. And my own mother, may God bless her, who's Christian, told me, this book is deep. You have to read it three times because of the layers that are in the book. So it's, it's, uh, it's outside, and if you have children or grandchildren, uh, please don't hesitate to get yourself a copy. Thank you.